There we go. Hey, uh, <laughs> hi guys. Hello, sir. Hi. This is the weirdest room. <laughs> I know, right? Yes. Professor Greg, yeah. I feel like cheating off of somebody. <laughs> all the, what are the answers? No, you're the one that busts them for cheating. You're the, you're the professor. We're the students. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi. Welcome. Have you had a good show? Yeah, it's amazing. Is it great? I love it here. I'm not leaving. It's great to be no, back I'm into the concert. I'm going to the Plaza. <laughs> well, maybe not. Um, no, it's great. You know, it's. Uh, I really missed. I missed doing conventions, and I missed the fans. And uh, as soon as uh, we were just wrapping up season three of Creep Show, and we were starting Walking Dead, and Bill had a Days of the Dead in Atlanta, mm -hmm. and I've gone like the last three years, but as a as a fan. So I just walk through the dealer's room and buy Freddy Krueger shit and, and yeah. spend a lot of money. And it's really fun. And I said to him, I'm like, can I come to one of the shows? And right? So I invited, come on. So I invited myself. You uh, asked, and he was like, yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I, those are the guys who know Bill who puts on the show. He's very quiet and like never smiles. And so I'm like, I saw him and I'm like, hey man, this is really great. Like people are awesome. And are you having fun? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, thank you guys for coming out. It really, uh, it means the world to me. You know, I mean, I, I, I got my start uh, with with Tom Savini and George Romero. My brother is working wherever he went. My brother's working the table with me, and <clears throat> he was reminding everybody the first convention that we ever went to. I think it was 1970. Six in Pittsburgh, and it was a Star Trek convention, and William Shatner was there yelling at everybody. Um, <laughs> and I, I met this guy who sold movie stills, and I bought my first Jaws movie stills. So I started collecting stills and stuff, and it was all because of this first convention that I went to. Um, and you know, as as luck would have it, you know, here I am, many years later, just following my dream of loving monsters and and movies and behind the scenes stuff. So um, I really want you guys to ask questions. I mean, these lovely ladies will do a great job. But I also, I, a lot of times, sometimes my panels come from the weirdest places of like somebody saying, oh, you worked on Boogie Nights, and then that's an hour conversation, um, <clears throat> which I can't have because there's kids in the room. However. Um, hey, they know what they're getting into. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's saying, true. This is true. This is a horror movie show. Yes. I mean, yes. yeah. <laughs> so does anybody have any questions to open up with? Sir. Yes. Uh, people want what they can't have. Do you think at any time that we'll be able to see the Creep Show episode with Marilyn Manson? You know, <clears throat> it was, uh, that was a really sad day for me because um, the episode was really interesting and the minute that this thing came out about these uh, allegations against him everyone just said we can never see it they, they can, we never even finished the episode because we had started working we had shot it we never we never finished it um, but you know <clears throat> the challenge the challenge is you know you you have to you have to read the room I mean honestly the world has changed so so much and you have to, you really have to sort of read the room in terms of what the temperature is for things. So you, you, there wasn't a second that we didn't say, yes, we need to be sensitive and we need to do what we need to do. And there, there's been a lot of other shows and all things that I've been involved in mm -hmm. that have been sensitive that no one kind of raised a red flag about. You know, I mean, look, if even if you go back and think of the, the amount of horror uh, and gore that's attributed to the genre towards women over decades and decades and decades. And there was a couple things that I worked on that I went, um, Skinner? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was, that was directed by a convict. Um, so, you know, but, but you just have to sort of be responsible. And there was, there was one other creep show episode that we had done that there was, somebody had sort of flagged as like, oh, well that might, somebody might find it offensive and we, well, we got to do our due diligence and we got to sort of investigate it and talk to the writer, talk to the director and 
the actors and everybody said, no, 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 we're comfortable with this and we think this is, this is good to move forward with. So, you know, somebody else asked me upstairs and I said, I don't think we'll ever see it. You know, we never finished it. As soon as that happened, it just kind of, um, it went away and we ended up um, replacing it with an animated episode that I got Danielle Harris and Mark Hamill and Ron Livingston did the voices. So uh, it was called Things in Oakwood's Past. And it's in season three, if you haven't seen season three, I don't want to ruin it, but it was really fun. I wanted to actually shoot the episode live action, but then we were like, hey, let's just do it as an animated episode to fill that spot. Thank Saw you. some other questions out there. You, sir? <laughs> Sorry, I'll be here for, I'll be here if you remember. I'll remember in a second. We'll go back to you, Doc. Yeah. Yes. What's A&B up to these days? You know, it's, it's funny because we've been amazingly good. You know, so you figure the last 12 years, Walking Dead has filled our slate. And we've been really fortunate because a lot of prosthetic shops kind of go in and out of of things, but Walking Dead really allowed us to, to keep a solid base crew, and we had three Walking Dead shows at one point. Um, we've been doing a lot of different stuff lately. You know, we did Lovecraft Country last year. Uh, we did Dexter. Um, we did uh, the, um, oh gosh, the, uh, oh my God, I can't even remember now. Kate Winslet show on HBO. Mayor of Easttown. We did Mayor of Easttown. So we, it, it's interesting because, you know, we did Watchmen. Mm -hmm. So you, you, we get a chance to do these, these shows. There's not 5,000 zombies or there's not a big giant creature, but there'll be like a dead body or an axe murder or just some like true crime kind of thing. So these producers move from show to show. Um, we're doing a show with J.J. Abrams right now. And... You know, I I met him with Simon Pegg, and JJ is like one of us. Like you know, <laughs> Star Wars. You know, it's just um, so. I every time I get an email from JJ, I'm like, I'm all excited. <laughs> like, JJ, <I'm> <laughs> um, so we're so we've been we've been amazingly prolific. You know, the majority of kind of the the tentpole stuff for us has been Walking Dead, but we have all these other shows that are going on. Um, there's a, uh, there's a movie that we're doing right now for HBO. It's a true crime uh, a murder that happened in Austin, Texas. This woman um, was having an affair and uh, uh, they ended up having this big confrontation and they had literally like a 10 minute ax fight in this, in, all true, like wow. in this like laundry room, the woman came in with an ax and tried to kill her. And they fought each other, and so um, so we're doing a they're doing a series on like a, tr a, a HBO true crime series on it, and um, they said, well, we have the real crime scene photos if you want to see them, and I've looked at you know I mean I've looked at real real dead body, and it's weird for me because I think I because I process it like oh you know. The head's turned this way, and you know, because I was pre-med, I, I study, I look at things very clinically, and I don't think about it, but then I looked at one picture, and I, and the idea that someone could attack someone with such force, that she, she was swinging the ax, and the ax hit the woman in the back of the head, and split, and, so the crime scene photos and the autopsy photos, like they would shave the person's head and you could see the impact of the ax. And you're like, man, if, if they ever like literally published crime scene photos, like the murder rate would drop. Like nobody would, nobody would kill them. Like, oh, that's horrible. Like why would, so it's, so it's always, um, it's always kind of strange to sort of equate it to like the, the real thing. We've done a lot of stuff like that, but we've been really, really busy, but kind of, under the radar. Like I was thinking the other day, I'm like, nobody knows what we do because we don't do a lot of publicity or posting about the company. We've been around uh, since 1988. So we're the longest running makeup effects company in the world. I don't um, know if you remember 
Ben Rittenhouse. He yes, lives Chad. in Australia now. Wait, no. No, that's Chad. Chad lives in Australia. Yeah. That's right. I was married to Ben. So he, he used to go to your Halloween. Go to my parties. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. we go to the shop all the time. Well, like, <laughs> I just texted him a picture to see if he recognized me. If he remembers me. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm much older than that. Yeah. <laughs> we all are. You remember your question? I remember it. And you started to touch on it. You mentioned you were pre med. Aside from any kind of journeymanship or apprenticeship, um, where, is, whether it's formal, formal or informal, did you get your education on? Well, when we when we did Day of the Dead, we we used a lot of medical textbooks. Like there's there's encyclopedias. Right. There's one there's one book called The Medical Legal Investigation of Death, and each chapter showcases a different way to die. And so when we when we did Day of the Dead, we went through the book and we're like, oh, that's cool, that's cool, that's cool. We should do that and. There was one that I remember specifically, there was a woman who had died. This is getting really morbid. Um, <laughs> this woman had died in her house and the dog oh. ate the lower part of her face away. Oh. Um, and there's a picture in the book of like this dead woman with half the face gone because the dog, you know. Right. So we did a zombie in Day of the Dead and we made it look like that. So, you know, it was, it was really uh, an opportunity to, to, to use what we could for reference. Um, but again, you know, I worked on a non-horror movie. This was, so when KMB first started, we started in 1988. We did Intruder, we did um, Nightwish, and we did UHF, like the big Weird Al Yankovic. <laughs> so it, it's funny, because so many people come up to go, oh my God, I love UHF. I'm like, what? <laughs> so those were the first three movies that that KMB had ever done. So we we did like super low, but they were really cheap, and you know we just kind of had some fun um, because up to that point we couldn't get hired because it's the catch twenty two of well how do we know we can do the job? So we can't hire you, but you won't get the job unless you do the job. So we got stuck in this like catch twenty two for a little while. Um, and then I got called to go to Disney Studios. Deborah Hill, who produced Halloween, was producing a movie called Gross Anatomy. And it was about medical school students. It was like Matthew Modine and Daphne Zuniga. And I walked into the meeting and George Romero had told Deborah Hill that I had been pre-med before I started my career in makeup effects. So I walked in. Deborah Hill's there, and they go, all right, you're hired. So they kind of hired me on the spot because of my relationship with George, and George had said, oh, there's this guy, and he does makeup, uh, makeup effects, but he was pre-med. So we did all the cadavers that they were autopsying in the movie. Now, they could have got paid 150 bucks and got a real cadaver and put it on, because you know you can get cadavers for like medical school research and stuff. So they're like, oh, we'll just buy some real bodies and we'll put them on the set. I'm like, well, okay, so hour 10, day one, under the lights, come back to me and tell me how that worked out for you. Um, so we ended up building, we ended up building all these bodies, you know, and they, you could like skin them and peel the skin back and all that stuff. And, and we got the job because, uh, in part, because I had pre-med, you know, uh, anatomy training. So then cut to our next job, uh, it was Kevin Costner, and we were interviewing for Dances with Wolves, and he saw the skinned bodies, and he goes, can you guys make skin buffalo? Because we have the scene where we need all these dead buffalo. So within two years of K&B's inception, we went from this little tiny movie to Dances with Wolves. So we kind of yeah. almost jumped, yeah. like, really cool. not, past or over, but in, a, in addition to Halloween 5, Texas Chainsaw 3, Nightmare on Elm Street 5, like all those, we were doing those, and then it was like, oh, well, let's do Misery and City Slickers, and so we had clients at Castle Rock, and we worked for Rob Reiner and, and uh, Stephen King and those guys. So 
So we were fortunate enough that we kind of leapt past that doing low budget horror effects and, and got into some mainstream movies pretty quickly. Yeah, I just want to say uh, I've been going to conventions for like two decades. It's a huge honor just to have you in the same room. Nevertheless, live in the same time period with your absolute master. That's amazing. Well, I think I begin to say, but I won't. You, you know, you're awesome. But um, <laughs> I was just going to say, uh, why should I just leave? You want to come up? <laughs> no, but um, I was going to ask you. Uh, Walking Dead seemed to pose a lot of technical. Uh, uh, difficulties for even a master such as yourself. Could you share one with us that was a real challenge for you, like one of the Walker episodes, you know, like say like a well walker or something like that. Or maybe a moment that pops in your head is like, wow, that was a real challenge uh, doing that piece. You know? It all looks just absolutely marvelous. You know? Well, thanks. Well, you know, it's, it's strange because up until that point in our career, we had really virtually done no television. We had done all features. We've done all movies, you know, Robert Rodriguez and Sam Raimi and Drag Me to Hell, and we've done a lot of movies. And then um, we did, I had a run of about two years. I did Inglorious Bastards and then Piranha and Book of Eli and Predators. Like I was traveling all over the world doing all these different movies. Came back to LA and Frank Darabont called and said, okay, we got a Green Lantern walking down. We're gonna start shooting in six weeks. And we did six episodes. Like, we just, I thought everybody loved zombies. I didn't realize that the world hadn't figured out how great zombies were until I walked in dead. Um, so, for me, the challenge was um, adapting what we do to a television schedule. Because for movies, you got six months, and you got four months to shoot it, and in TV, you got seven days. So, the idea of coming up with interesting, clever ways to do zombie kills, and for the most part, in the beginning, was mostly practical. There's some VFX stuff here and there, like if we're gonna split a head in half, we'll do VFX, but um, it was just the undertaking of something that had never been done before, the sheer volume of, okay, we got a scene in the opening, and Rick's riding down the street on his horse, and he comes around a corner, and there's 500 zombies that chase him. And by the way, yes, they ran in episode one. Everybody forgets that. But in episode one, it was like, well, the zombies ran. In episode two, the zombies were smashing on the, the uh, department store window, so they were smart. I said, no, we just didn't know what the rules were yet. We hadn't figured it out. <laughs> um, so it was the sheer volume of like, how are we gonna do this? And you know, I had worked on Land of the Dead with George, and we really were, continually trying to push the envelope. So I think that was the big challenge was people going, well, how are you gonna do this in a TV schedule? We shoot seven days an episode and you have to do 200 makeups. In season one, I remember when we were shooting episode two where, where Glenn and Rick put the guts on themselves for the first of 500 fucking times. <laughs> <laughs> and walk through the crowd and then it starts to rain and the, and the guts wear off. We, we had 200 zombies a day, and so we'd go to work at 4 a.m., we'd get all the zombie makeups done by 8, we'd go to set, we'd shoot till 9 o'clock at night, we'd go, clean them up, go home, get back to the hotel at 10 or 11, go to the bar, have a drink, go to sleep, get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and do it all over again. Um, and we didn't care, we were like, fucking zombies, <laughs> it's amazing. Um, that was also 11 years ago, so yeah. <laughs> was not as smart as I did now. Uh, but the volume just, you know, and, and every season coming up with, with different looks for the zombies and things, you know, I, I, I struggle with uh, production on a daily basis to say, the minute that you make a zombie easy to kill, it's not scary anymore. Mm -hmm. And if the characters aren't afraid of them, then the audience won't be afraid of them. So the episodes that I shoot, the episodes that I direct, I try to make sure there's scary elements that the characters might actually be afraid. And I don't know if you guys are all caught up on Walking Dead, but there was a, an episode that I directed uh, in this last block with Lauren Ridloff, where it's kind of a People Under the Stairs tribute episode. Uh, it was 
scary. Like, everyone's like, hey, have you seen this movie, People Under the Stairs? I worked on People Under the Stairs. <laughs> yes, I know. It is. But it was fun because it was an opportunity to really, and Lauren Ridloff, who's such an amazing actress, um, really to sell. The reason that episode works is because you see the terror in her face. Yeah. Any movie, look, Dee Wallace, who's sitting upstairs, when they shot The Howling, and she's in the room, and Eddie Quist transforms into the werewolf. Half of the terror comes from seeing her face. Mm -hmm. And then they did American Werewolf in London, mm -hmm. and he's in the room alone, and you don't have that person reacting to the fear. It's a different experience, because then you're just watching a great transformation. So people forget. So I'll constantly tell the writers and tell the directors, make sure that Rosita or Daryl or Negan they still can be a little afraid that they might lose control of the situation and the zombies will kill them. But if somebody walks into a room and kills 20 zombies in four seconds, they're not scary anymore. Right. So we're trying to make, I, I, I got this, I got this. Scary. Yeah. 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 Um, so I like a lot, like you have great movie special effects. My favorite personally is From Dust to Dawn. Um, my question is, is there one movie in particular that you wish you did the effects on, or like, oh, I wish I could do the effects? Is there like one movie in particular, or movies? Well, when they did, when Mick Harris did The Stand, mm -hmm. I really wanted that job. Like, I love Stephen King, I love that book. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard Rubenstein gave me my first job. He worked on Day of the Dead, I worked on, so I kind of didn't think I was a shoe in but I thought, I should be able to get this job. <laughs> yeah. Flew to New York, we did an actual, uh, we did a sculpt, a prototype withered corpse sculpt, because there's a scene when they're in Pittsburgh and they're going through the, 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 the tunnels and all the dead bodies are in the cars, and so we made, and I flew out to New York and met with Richard, and he's like, yeah, sorry, it's not gonna go your way. And I was really disappointed because I wanted to work on the stand, and, I didn't know Mick Garris at the time, but Mick and I are now quite good friends because we've worked together for so much. Um, but yeah, I felt like that one kind of got away. I would have loved to have worked on that because I just, uh, and then they did the, the CBS, CBS just did one, which I didn't watch because I haven't listened to it. Did anybody watch it? The Stand? Was it any good? And Usually we've done stuff never the best most of the time. Yeah, right? Yeah. Never. Yeah. I understand. But anyway, I mean, look, I mean, I love the book. But so guys, the stand got a Blu-ray, the original got a, a, a like a 4K Blu-ray release recently, That's which right. is very exciting because my DVD is like 20 years old, yep. you know, <laughs> and it's very grainy. <laughs> and I tried to get them to change the credit in the movie to special effects makeup by KB Effects on the Blu-ray, <laughs> just to fuck with everyone. <laughs> didn't, didn't work. But you I, know, one of my favorites, um, and not a lot of people will remember this one, but um, ticks. <laughs> oh, I still have one of them. I still have you one do. of the ticks. You know, on our podcast that we do, we have a prop we would like to own segment, and a tick was the one I, I want a tick. I want it with a needle. I want the syringe. <laughs> but I have a tick about that big. <laughs> And I, I take it to Georgia, and every once in a while, I put it on somebody's back. Because we got a lot of ticks in Georgia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, I, I, you know what? It's funny. I, I, I hate to say, there's so many random, you know. Yeah. If I sat and looked at my IMDb, mm -hmm. I would be like, I didn't do it. Did I work on this? I don't remember. <laughs> And then someone asked you a question like ticks. And ticks like, oh yeah, we built. We had the whole platform. We had a big platform with the set with the big yeah. giant tick coming out. Yeah. yeah, we interviewed recently one of the um, actresses that was in it, Virginia Keene, and she had like a tick stuck to her back. And mm -hmm. I have some tick trauma from when I was forced to go camping when I was a kid in California. Lots of ticks happened. Um, in California. Yes, in the sequoias, and I was, so I had tick trauma. So when that came out. I was like, loved it, but I was also like, this is why I don't like the outdoors. <laughs> well, let me tell you, when you work on The Walking Dead, yes, <laughs> it's uh, it's rough because you're in the woods all the time, yes. Yes. and you have to go home, and people have to, like, you gotta find somebody you really like to go. Can you, you gotta do the tick check. You get home, you get in the yeah. shower. 
Yep. You know, people like me have a lot of hair. You're yeah. always feeling. I remember it was, we were shooting the episode where, this was season four, where Rick takes Carol away from the prison and leaves her off, drops yeah. her off, yeah. and deserts her. So I was out at the, at the neighborhood location. I'm driving back to the studio. I'm in the car, I'm doing this, oh. and I go, and I look down and there's a giant tick in my, and I literally, I dropped the tick, I dropped the tick in the car, I slammed on the brakes, jumped out of the car in the middle of the road, and I'm like, well, I gotta sell the car. And there's a freaking tick in the car. And I've had a couple where they're embedded in you, there's a special way you have to pull them out. Um, and they they usually go for parts that you don't want to talk about, <laughs> and it's a bummer. <laughs> Not literally, but that, that's kind of funny. No, it's, it's it's horrifying and awful and gross. So that movie was very effective. If you guys haven't seen it, check it out. It's so gooey. It looks goo. <laughs> I know we have more questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you sir. Yep. Yes. Early in the seat. Early in the Walking Dead. Was there ever anything you said to yourself, maybe we shouldn't do this because we'll get some blowback from it? Because there was a lot of stuff on that show I, I would watch and be like, man, I can't believe they actually let them do that. I yeah. Just tell them. yeah. I, there's been a lot of fights. Like, even going back to season two, because in the comic book, Carl kills Shane. And I loved that. And when we got the script, and it wasn't Carl killing Shane, I was really bummed. And I went to Kirkman and said, this is a mistake. I think Carl should do it. It was the most shocking thing. It, the two most shocking, well, three. The three, I feel like doing. I'm doing Monty Python Spanish oh, English. Right. First, it's uh, shocking. Yes. Um, was uh, Carl killing Shane? Was Laurie being killed by the governor in the comic books? And Glenn being killed by Negan? And I, the Glenn and Negan of it, I was sitting at Comic-Con, out of breakfast, Fox International breakfast, and I'm sitting with Steven and Robert Kirkman when issue 100 came out. And they were talking about it, and I hadn't seen it, and I opened it up, and it was the close-up of Glenn with the baseball bat and his eye coming out and him screaming Maggie's name. And I, it, it was awful. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't even, imagine so then cut to like three years later hey Greg here's the script for the next episode that you're directing and I directed that episode um, but there's been a lot of times that I kind of threw the bullshit flag like when Rick and everybody pull up side outside the sanctuary with like 120 people and they're firing guns and they don't shoot anybody drove me great. I directed the episode I'm like please let me shoot somebody <laughs> and then at the end when Rick slices Negan's throat, and then Maggie comes up, I said, Maggie should shoot. Maggie should shoot Negan. I wanted Maggie to kill him. And I'm like, I, I don't care what people, Maggie needs to be the one to kill Negan. I guess it, it wasn't a mistake having Rick kill Shane in the TV show, because I love the- I don't think it was a mistake, but I, no, because I love that moment. That moment was, was you know- It was like a Western duel. Well, season, all of season two, you know, for me, it's always interesting to go back because a lot of people pan season two. They, they, season two is the best. Season two is the best season. Yeah. Because that's when you fall in love with Carol and Daryl and Rick. That that season and Scott Wilson and that season sets up the entire series and allows you to fall in love with every one of those characters. And people that, that said, oh, well, not much happened in that that season you know Sophia coming out of the barn like when, when, when we started season two they sent me four or five scripts at a time and I hadn't even left for 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 Georgia yet I was just sitting there and I read the first five so it opens with them leaving the CDC we shot a whole bunch of stuff that never ended up there was a whole scene where they leave the CDC and they leave Shane behind and Shane chases is chasing the RV and he starts to get tired and there's zombies coming after him but the zombies don't get tired. So he can't run anymore and he starts slowing down and this big horde of zombies is about to engulf him. And then Rick and Daryl come back and grab Shane. So we shot this whole opening 
And we never, it's never, it never ended up in the episode uh, where they leave the CDC. So um, I remember reading the first four scripts and it was Sophia getting lost and them getting to the farmhouse and Carl being shot. And I couldn't, I couldn't put them down. Like when I, when I was done reading my kids were five and seven and I went and hugged my kids. Cause I was just, it was so, the, the writing was so good. And you know, you go back and you look at Walking Dead from the beginning and you see what those, who those people were, who Rick was, who Lori was. Um, who Shane was, man, the show, it, the scripts were so good. Um, so I got sucked in, man. And um, so that's why I think season two is like one of the best seasons of it. Yeah, more. Any other questions? Yeah, what's up? Yeah, um, this is just a quick one. I was just wondering, um, I was, I'm gonna ask about the art um, you did on the zombies in um, Walking Dead. Um, on, an, uh, on average, how long would it take to do one person's makeup? Um, or is each individual zombie more like an independent amount of time? Well, that's a great question, by the way. Thank you. Um, it's usually, we average an hour and a half. Um, a lot of times, and you know, the makeups have changed through the course of the series. Like in season one, aside from Bicycle Girl, the zombies were fresher looking. You know, we, we, we sort of, explained that because she had been torn in half and she was lying in the in the park in the sun she was more shriveled and dried than the other ones that had kind of prosthetics and just color and paint job um, but it's usually about an hour and a half and you know the, they the, the performers come in they sit in the chair put a ball cap on you put the prosthetics on you fit teeth on them and the teeth actually cover their lips so they can't talk, they drool a lot. Um, and then you put the contact lenses in. So it's an all-encompassing sensory deprivation experience. And on days where, there were days where we would need to do 20, we would need to do like 20 hero makeups. And 20 hero makeups would take 10 people about three and a half hours in and out. So you'd need an army of makeup artists and then you have the, the masks in the mid-ground, and then you have the characters in the background. So it's a, it's, a, it's a massive undertaking, but it's usually, now if it's a zombie that's got like no shirt on and you need to do the whole upper body rotted, that's probably like four hours. When we did Winslow, remember Winslow had all the like the little the, um, spikes and stuff? He was a full body suit. Um, and we had to put one of those race car driver cool suits underneath because it was so hot. Um, but at, on average, it's about an hour. Yeah. Good you. question, thank you. Well, I got one. Um, so, you know, a lot of us would, would love to do the kind of work that you do. What advice are you gonna have for somebody who's interested in getting into effects, makeup, prosthetics? Well, I'm very, very proud to say that, that Walking Dead has had a very big influence on practical makeup effects. Because before Walking Dead came out, it, Walking Dead kind of made zombie makeup like a household thing. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of young people and a lot of women, which I love that yeah. most of the makeup artists that I know now are women that come up and they, they're like, I want to do makeup, I want to do prosthetics, I want to do special effects. I met a bunch of them today, some of them there. Awesome. So, um, you know, the, the, the real challenge now, especially with, with COVID and the way the world is, is that there's not enough people, there's not enough makeup people out there. Like there's a lot of productions, everybody jumped into production quickly, and you have to hire more crew people than normal. Like normally on The Walking Dead, we had four makeup artists um, that were the permanent crew, and then when we had big days, we would hire additionals. But now, because we have to have people to come in and do the makeup in the morning and clean the makeup up. We hired, we have 10 people on our crew now. So the makeup crews get bigger, also because you know you don't want to cross pollinate makeup. Um, you know, you have little individual makeup rooms and it's very, very, yeah. yeah, you have to take a lot of extra precautions um, to do that, so you need more people. So it's a really good time now. You know, when you put your, put your, um, 
portfolio together is the best thing. You know, and it's got to be well-rounded. You know, you have to make a decision or whether you want to be on set doing makeup or you want to be a lab rat. You want to build stuff. You want to sculpt and you want to mold and you want to run foam and, you know, you want to do all that kind of stuff. That's what, that's the way that it works. And they're very different jobs, you know, like working in a lab and sculpting and molding and there's more uh, chemistry and there's more kinds of things involved in that. But if you're on set, you know, then you're dealing with the actors every day and the actors have to trust you. you know? So, you know, you gotta, uh, there, there's enough information out there to allow you to help sort of fine tune where you wanna go, where you would wanna land in that, <coughs> excuse me, um, where you would wanna land in that world. But, you know, putting a portfolio together and just showing people what you're capable of doing is the best way to do it, you know. Just, and don't take blurry pictures of like your little brother with a gallon of blood dumped on his head. It's not really makeup, it's just your brother, annoying your little brother, yeah. uh, which, I, which I did to him a million times. Um, but yeah, that's really, and you know, there, there's a lot of commercial production in a lot of different places. It depends on where you want to live to. You know, nobody wants to live in California anymore. Yeah. It's kind of crazy, like Georgia's like the, the the hotbed of production. New Orleans is getting big again, and New Mexico, I know they're doing a bunch of stuff. You know, ever since they did Mandalorian and they built that, the volume, that sort of, uh, that virtual reality set, now everyone's like, hey, you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to go to elaborate locations. You can just shoot everything and build it all, and you can shoot anywhere you want. So I think that's gonna open up a lot of productions for places that may not necessarily be associated with like a, Holly, a, a, a Hollywood sort of vibe. I saw a question in the back. I saw a question in the back somewhere. Yeah. Yes. You have a Steelers hat on? No, just a yellow hat. All right. Get out. No. I was a Steelers hat. I was no, saying. just a yellow hat. They suck anyway. So. Uh, so you had mentioned Tom Savini and your work with him. Yeah. Um, what's the process like when working with him? Because I know you guys work on together early on that really stood out to you as like a special scene that you really enjoyed doing? Hmm. That's interesting. Well, you know, Tom, I, I got associated with Tom when he was literally like at the height of his career. So this is a crazy true story. So I grew up in Pittsburgh and they shot Dawn of the Dead, Night of the Living Dead, uh, Night Riders, about 25 minutes from my house, like right around Pittsburgh. My uncle was an, act, was an actor in the crazies. So we ended up meeting George Romero. We were on a family vacation in Rome and we went to sit down and have dinner at a restaurant and George Romero was sitting across the restaurant with his wife. And we went over and we said hello and he knew my uncle and it was kind of like one of those, hey, you should come down to the office one day and visit. So I started going to visit him, and when they were shooting Creep Show, we would go out to Monroeville, and we, the first time I ever went to the set of Creep Show, walked into the gymnasium, walked around the corner, uh, there was the back of all these movie flats, and walked in, and it was the basement set for the crate, where the, with the blood stains on the, the, on the ground and everything. And that's the day I met Tom Savini. So, I got offered a job. Chris Romero, George's wife at the time, said, hey, you should come work on the Creep Show. You could be like a production assistant. And I turned it down, because I'm like, well, I'm going to college. And so, but Creep Show was the first movie set that I ever visited, and I kind of felt like at home there, like I could go anytime I wanted to visit. So, uh, and my parents would travel a lot, so I would shoot videos. And that's the other thing that I learned with Tom, was Tom always had a video camera around. So when we did Day of the Dead and we did Creep Show, uh, when he was doing Creep Show and all the movies that I've done subsequent to that, I was the one filming all the behind the scenes. So when you buy the DVD of Evil Dead 2, all that footage is my personal footage on the DVD. So I always documented everything. I have hours and hours that no one's ever seen. I have a hard drive. I have a hard drive at my house I pulled out on, on Halloween night. It was showing some of the guys, it was footage of me and Robert Englund 
uh, and Miko Hughes and Heather on the set of Nightmare 7, when the tongue comes out of the Freddy mouth and wraps around Heather's head, found all this video. I haven't seen it, and I think Wes was there. It was really nice. Um, but to make a long story short, Creepshow was kind of what started it all for me. So I would shoot these little videos for, for people and for my mom, and um, Brian found a, a, a video that I shot that was me filming my office in Pittsburgh when I was 19. And I said, Mom, Dad, uh, one day you're gonna see my name on this poster. And it was a Creepshow poster. And I was filming it, and while I was filming the poster, I sent the video to my mom and dad. So he found it, he's like, do you remember saying that? I'm like, no, but evidently I willed it to happen because then Creepshow comes out now, and it's Creepshow, and it has my name on it. Like, I couldn't have been, I could have, I could have filmed any other movie poster in the world, but I just happened to be filming. I should have filmed Jaws, but. <laughs> but I did get to restore the shark for the Motion Picture Academy Museum. Those of you that don't know that, there's, there was, um, there was one, when, when, you, when Jaws came out, I loved it, I loved, I, I embellished this story because it's fun. Jaws comes out, <laughs> so, right, so Jaws comes out, you're a studio executive, you're sitting in an office. What do we got on the back lot? Jaws just came out. It's the biggest movie in the in the world. What should we do? Like, oh, well, we have the molds for the shark. That's it. Call the guys. Let's make a shark. We'll hang it in the back lot. We'll paint it green. It won't make any sense, but it'll be great. So they made a shark out of the molds, and it hung at Universal. If anybody wants to see, I have a picture of me standing next to it when I was, I don't know, 76, 13. Um, so anyway, the, they had this shark at, at Universal for years and years and years. So when you'd go to the back lot tour, you'd see the shark and you'd take a picture of it. So then somebody went, probably the son of the guy with his bad cigarette voice, said, hey, that doesn't look like a real shark. You should get a real shark. And he calls his dad. His dad goes, okay, get rid of that. Just send it to a junkyard. We don't need it. So the shark goes to a junkyard. This is a very elaborate story. I'm making it more entertaining. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so the shark goes to a junkyard in Simi Valley, or Sun Valley. So Jaws nerds like me know the shark's there, so we drive by every once in a while. There's the shark that used to be at Universal, and it's the last shark out of the original molds. Well, the molds don't exist anymore. So I went in one day, and I was like, hey, uh, how much would you sell that for? But you can't afford it. It was like not that guy. Everybody talks like that. Everybody in LA talks like they're in the mob. Right? Anyway, the smoker. Yeah, well, well, well it's, it's it's the atmosphere. It's, it's the smog. Everybody in LA talks. Like that. This is a fact. So, um, so to make a long story short, the junkyard closed about four years ago. And the guy who owned the junkyard donated the shark to the museum, Motion Picture Academy Museum. So I reached out and said, I want to restore the shark. I said, I will donate all of the time as a donation to the museum under my name, but I want to do it. So they brought this big giant truck over with a crane that had to lift the shark up out of it. It was like in this big giant crate. And we spent about six months. We stripped all the 40-year-old paint off of it. It was pristine underneath. It was all fiberglass. So we had to sand it all up. Um, there was no inside of the mouth. But Joe Alves, the production designer, had given me the teeth. So I had all the original teeth. So we molded that. Oh my God. And we sculpted the inside of the mouth. So if you look online, Jaws Motion Picture Academy, and you see that shark. I don't care what anybody says. I mean, you guys can have it, but I I have pictures of like my dog in the shark's mouth. And, and, and we had it, we had it, at, we had it at KMB for about a year because then with COVID the museum wasn't ready. So then they tried to figure out like how are we going to get it in, and they had, they had to take the windows off just to get the shark into the museum. Wow. So uh, so I went opening night to the museum, and I was very excited, and I. You go up the elevator and the escalators, and it's all the sharks there, and everybody's ooh ah ooh the shark, and I really just want to stand there and go, I did that, I did that. I did that. I, and there were a lot of people because I stood under it for like an hour just waiting for someone to walk over and go, hey, are you the guy that? Yes, that was me. That's me. Um, and so there's a little plaque on the wall that has my name on it. 
So I've done everything I can to work on Jaws without actually working on Jaws. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think you, that counts, yeah? It does count. It totally well, counts. And I haven't even talked to Travis about it yet. But we, <laughs> one day we had, you know, when the shark was done, we called uh, Jeffrey Kramer, who played Hendrix, came up to the yeah. top. And Joe Alves and Roy Arbogast, who was like the special effects guy who made the skin for the sharks. And they came up to see the shark. And Roy, who, you know, Roy Arbogast did the thing. He did, like, he's like the premium special effects artist in the world. Um, he walked in and he got, like, tears in his eyes. And, and all I could think about was all of those guys who spent months and months and months building this shark that didn't work, and whether it worked or it didn't work, at night, those motherfuckers had to go back every night and try to make it work. It's not just like, the day's over, okay, go home, have dinner. Every single night, they went back and they worked. And, and having been a guy who's worked on movies where something doesn't work, it literally, it kills your soul because that's you, what you're about. So when we did the shark restoration, I said, to me it's a tribute to every filmmaker who has gone up against odds that they were not gonna be able to defeat, and they defeated it. So when you see the shark hanging in the museum, to me that's what that shark stands for. Plus it looks cool. <laughs> so that was, so I did work, so I worked on Jaws. Yeah, hell yeah you did. Well guys, that that's all the time we got. Guys, thanks for coming and thanks for supporting the show, Walking Dead, and this show, and uh, loving horror as much as I do. Thank yeah. you.